Hello, my name is Deborah Bowman, artist and instructor at the Université de la Montagne in France, doctoral student in arts at the Mika Adeas Laboratory. Today, I'm presenting a communication by the independent New York curator Larry List entitled Entering the Art World After Art School. The communication will be in English with subtitles in French added later. A special welcome to my master's students in visual arts, research and pro IPAS in my course, Globalization of Art. Thanks to the Mika Adeas Laboratory and to Bordeaux Montaigne University for hosting this communication. Thank you so much, Larry, for being here with us today from New York. Let's go to the opening image. Now I'd like to present our guest speaker. Larry List has worked as a studio artist, model builder, researcher, writer, curator, and master planner of exhibition spaces around the world. He has a BFA from the Tyler School of Art and an MA and MFA from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Researching and replicating lost artworks for museums led to curating exhibitions for the Noguchi Museum, the Menel Collection, the Reykjavik Art Museum, the DOX Contemporary Art Center in Prague, among others. Among his curatorial projects are found language, digital domains, skin trade, cage, and kino. He is the author of the book and curatorial project, The Imagery of Chess Revisited. Larry List has contributed writings for exhibitions at the Tate Modern, the Andy Warhol Museum, and here in Bordeaux for the Takako Saito exhibition at the CAPC. Currently, um, Larry List is writing a book on the transition of 20th century print processes into 21st century digital media and the introduction to a catalog on the work of Sherry Levine. You can find more information and links on the website of Mika Adeas at the University of Bordeaux Montaigne. Entering the art world after art school. Larry has prepared an innovative exploration of how to find your special niche in the world of art after your art school or university degree, a world that can be confusing, competitive, often harsh, but rewarding if you find a spot that's right for you where your talents will be appreciated. For French students, this is an enlightening overview of the multiple opportunities for work in the art world, a world that you will be facing soon. This communication will give you not only a plethora of ideas, but also hope for the future and encouragement much needed in this difficult time for the arts. Thank you so much, Larry, for being with us here today from New York. Uh, well, thank you for inviting me to speak uh, again today. Uh, last time I discussed uh, artist life or job experiences and how they contributed to the discovery of artists' own personal styles. But um, you are all working toward completion of your studies at this point and eventually departing the academic art environment for the art world at large. And so, again, we ask the question, where am I in all of this, this big art world? Today, we're not going to speak about aesthetics or your ideas. Instead, we'll focus on practical ways you can find a starting place in the art world. And by art world, let's consider the network of artist studios, where you can assist making art, managing and planning inventory work or do correspondence for the artist. Uh, there are museums, commercial galleries and not-for-profit spaces, all of which need correspondence, inventory work, catalog entries, condition reports, provenance and biographic research, uh, and many other, many other sort of jobs. The commercial galleries, like the museums, have all these needs, plus they need collector research and front desk sort of greeting uh, personnel. Not-for-profit spaces are the same as the museums and galleries, but usually with fewer people and less money, but possibly increased opportunity. Uh, there are, of course, art publications that you could turn to, magazines, catalogs, books, and uh, many sort of publications on the web these days. Uh, and those, those publications need people who can write, uh, do memos, letters, emails, press releases, reviews, articles, etc., as well as photography, website design, 
editing and graphic design. There are auction houses, again, needing many of the same skills as the museums and the publications, as well as important research on finding sellers and buyers of future art. Uh, in line with that, there are people who are art appraisers, and you might find work with them, sort of based on knowledge of art styles and periods, uh, ability to do condition reports, provenance, and market research. Art handlers and preparators are in uh, quite a proliferation, and they need to have a knowledge of materials, possibly light carpentry and installation. Art expediters are especially of growing importance as uh, the art world becomes more global and uh, art fairs proliferate. They sort of cover crating, storage, shipping, scheduling, correspondence, and a, a plethora of legal and customs forms, that all that, all that uh, must be sort of in proper order before artwork can be moved from one place to another. Every artist, good, bad, or uh, otherwise, uses art supplies. And so there is always work to be found in art supply stores if one has a basic knowledge of art materials. <clears throat> in conjunction with galleries, auction houses, and museums, are independent art consultants. And they sort of uh, must have a knowledge of art trends, collectors' lifestyles, as well as condition reports, provenance, and market research. And so you might find work with an art consultant. Artists' estates and art foundations also sort of need many researchers and corresponders uh, to support their efforts in uh, you know, supporting the legacy of the artists. And then of course, anytime there's a show in a museum, the, there has to be exhibition design and fabrication. And so there are jobs to be done, drafting, designing, and uh, building and installing. And what you may know best is art teaching, everything from pre-kindergarten to postgraduate. There, your art knowledge, along with psychology and social skills are paramount. And of course, you might find work uh, working with independent writers or curators or become independent writers and curators, in which case you'll sort of need to employ many of these other skills that we've touched upon. Now, there's also growing sort of like uh, uh, job sources in the media and internet, doing web design, game design, new media installations and communications. So which areas that I mentioned interest you the most? Who might you know already working in these areas? What skills are needed in each area? And importantly, before you leave school, what additional related courses or seminars might you take uh, before you depart uh, your, your, your school and go out into the world? So let's consider sort of what are one's different skill sets? There's all of your hands-on studio skills with drawing, painting, sculpting, mold making, carpentry, welding, <laughs> et cetera. There's your knowledge of history, what you've accrued during the time, uh, your time in school, your knowledge of art styles, periods, materials, and the general art milieu and cultural milieu, both of our present day and other eras. Your ability to research information can be a very important skill set to do provenance, biography, and market research history. Writing is a central skill for almost everything. And by writing, I mean communicating clearly in written and spoken form. Now this will take the form of memos, letters, and emails, press releases, reviews and articles, catalog entries, condition reports, which demand clear technical descriptions, catalog essays and books. You need to have a knowledge of grammar, spelling and accepted style. Later, I might mention the $6 million letter that I wrote that succeeded in getting me um, these two major sculptures, one by David Hare and one by Max Ernst from the Museum of Modern Art, all because I was able to write a clear, concise letter 
in plain English, describing the need to, to borrow these works. I encourage people coming out of academic training to avoid sesquipedia, which is the use of long words, and avoid pleonastic tendencies, which is the use of more words than necessary. Out in the real world, people do not have a lot of time. They want to know what you need, what you want, or what you're telling them as quickly and straightforwardly as possible. And above all, avoid using art jargon. Now, Kurt Vardino, formerly the director of the Museum of Modern Art, once said that the use of art jargon is like teenage smoking. It's an unnecessary attempt to appear older and more sophisticated than one really is. You also, in all of your writing and speaking, uh, especially your writing, beware of typos, misspellings, bad grammar, casual email style form. They immediately undercut your credibility. Even one misspelled word in a letter can, be, uh, can doom your prospects. So you must be aware of all of those things. Now, another important uh, talent to have uh, is the ability to edit. Now, many, many people can write and write well, which is great. The ability to edit, which is to improve and clarify the writing of others, is an, a, a, um, a separate skill. And not everyone sort of has that skill, but it's a valuable skill to have. And along with editing text also comes indexing, uh, preparing bibliographies, footnotes, and obtaining photo rights. Uh, all of these things are important in one's entry level jobs because it's often indexing and these other things are exactly what the person hiring you doesn't want to have to do. So it's important that you would be able to do those things. And once again, knowledge of grammar, spelling, and accepted style are critical. In the global art market, language fluency is very valuable. Functional knowledge of more than one language, spoken or written, can be a big asset to you. Regrettably, I am an American who can only speak English, and it was a big deficit for me throughout my career. Grant writing is an important, specific, and very well-paid skill. Um, every museum, every artist, every alternative space needs, more than anything else, money. And so even when a museum is cutting staff, they will throw curators overboard, but they will keep the grant writers because the grant writing is the source of funding for future projects. And you can take courses in grant writing to learn the specifics of that. There's also the tech and ever expanding computer literacy area, Word, PowerPoint, Excel, Photoshop, all of those, the more programs that you know and can use efficiently, uh, the more you have to offer uh, potential employers. Photography, the ability to photograph artwork accurately, not to make arty photographs, but just accurate uh, photographs of the artworks and also to document sites and installations. Now, the art world is 50% objects and images. The other 50%, and I cannot stress this enough, is human relations. Etiquette and good manners are uh, vital. You must be polite and respectful, always and to everyone. You will have to learn to cultivate incredible patience and sociability because as you go into the art world, the people in the art world, either successful artists or dealers or, or collectors um, are usually people who are not used to taking no for an answer. And so you must be, be able to be patient and sort of meet people's needs. Also necessary is a neat, clean appearance. Now, 
it expresses competence, a sense of organization, respect for oneself, for others, and for the job. Now, the young man with the torn jeans and the young woman wearing practically no jeans are uh, perfectly fine uh, in non-work situations. But if you are in a gallery, a museum, or uh, other situ situations, you need to dress in a simple, neat way. Nothing is more important than the focus on the art. And so as Coco Chanel, the French designer said, you want to be simple, just better. And so that's an important thing coming out of the casual environment of school. Another thing that is vital is punctuality. It also expresses your competence, your sense of organization, your respect for yourself and others. And as the, uh, the film director and comedian Woody Allen once said, success, 90% of it is showing up on time. Attention to detail is also important in the arts. Uh, when you have to examine a work, you have to examine things carefully. In this case, uh, I examined sort of a painting that was made by the composer, John Cage. He made this for a show that I was doing and it had hung in the music room of a collector uh, for 60 years next to a grand piano that Cage himself had played on. And they, everyone just regarded it as a painting. The people who did his catalog raisonné of all of his musical compositions knew of it, but never bothered to look because he said, oh, it's just a painting. But when I got photos of it, I enlarged it and I saw that, well, it's a painting, but it's made out of alternating white and black uh, transcriptions of a playable piano piece. And I sent this to the primary sort of performer of Cage's work. Uh, and I got a phone call uh, at midnight one night. I just got this letter from you, Mr. List. And uh, this piece has never been performed. It's never been re recorded. It's the most important discovery about John Cage in the dozen years since his death. And within a day, we were offered sort of funding to record the first recording of it and to do the first world uh, premiere of the work in a weekend of uh, surrealist films with this pianist donating her time sort of like to perform that work and play uh, pieces to accompany other silent surrealist films. So an attention to detail. For 60 years, people were looking at this every day and they never bothered to think about it. And above all, you, you must have a willingness to do whatever needs done on your job. Every person and every job in the art world is important. They all contribute to the success of the final project. I mean, I show this image because once I was sort of uh, dressed and ready as everyone else was for the big opening of a museum show and someone was so nervous that they threw up in the reception area and everybody was dressed in their fancy clothes. But I realized we can't have our guests coming in uh, to a pile of vomit on the floor. So I found a mop and I mopped it up. And you have to be willing to do whatever needs done to make your project a success. So if you're applying for a job, Read the job description carefully. Can you do most of the tasks required? Few people can ever do everything that is asked for. You know, the job description for the employer is a wish list of everything they could possibly want. You need to research the employer, know as much about them as possible. What is their mission statement? What do they do? Who do they show? Research the biography, uh, their recent, their upcoming, and their past projects? And are there any projects of theirs that you've liked? And why have you liked them? Be prepared. Your letter and resume, you must prepare a letter and resume emphasizing any related experience or skills that are transferable to the job. You may not have worked sort of like in a museum or in a gallery, but maybe you worked in a hardware store and you had to do the inventory of everything in a hardware store. Well, you may be doing inventory in a gallery or museum, and so that is like a translatable skill that you can demonstrate that you have. 
your resume and your letter should always be custom crafted to the potential job. It has to be about them and the specifics of their job. Never use a standard form letter that you print out 50 copies of and send or a standard resume. You always make it custom crafted to the job you're applying for. To send a standard form letter to an employer is insulting and shows that you were lazy. You also must make the realization that people only post jobs if they have too much work. They are looking for someone who can do the work they least like to do to make their life easier. And in all of our cases, that's where we started. If you're invited for an interview, remember that the process is not about wonderful you. It is about meeting the employer's needs. They aren't looking for someone to talk about themselves and how bright or ambitious or attractive they are. The employer is definitely not looking for someone smart who may want to replace them. So you must focus on offering the skills you have to get done the work they need done. You must uh, express the notion that you're eager to support them and their projects. And again, to do whatever needs done. And above all, at the end of your interview, uh, please write a thank you note to your interviewer to thank them for taking time to talk to you. And um, in that case, sort of, um, I had an assistant at one point who saw there was an, uh, a job opening at a museum I had worked at. And he asked, would you write a, a recommendation letter for me? And I said, of course I will. And so, <clears throat> I uh, didn't see him again for a while. I ran into the curator of the museum that he had applied to. And I said, oh, I saw you had a job opening. Uh, did you, were you able to fill it? And they said, well, yes, we had 300 applicants. We talked with 30 of them over the phone and we had three come in for real interviews. And I said, and who did you end up hiring? He said, well, of course, we hired the only one who was polite enough to write a thank you note to me at, after their interview. So what is writing that thank you note worth? My assistant got hired for a job that, that paid $45,000 a year. He's worked at it for 15 years. That's $675,000 plus health insurance and a pension. So how important is it for you to be polite and to write a thank you note. I'd say pretty important. There is no how, your skill sets, and there's no who. And in the art world, it takes both. Your most valuable asset is your address book, whether digital or an old style, sort of like a paper and ink uh, thing. You, you need to stay in touch with your classmates and your teachers. Once you're out of school, your circle of friends and colleagues will become increasingly vital. Make a point to show up at openings. Try to talk to someone you don't already know. Attend lectures and events. Take notes, ask questions. People notice that and they're impressed since everybody seems to be looking at their phone, not listening to the, uh, the discussion these days. And after a show or event, if you like someone's work or you like their ideas, Write them a note saying that you like them and explaining why. Now, here we have uh, the illustration of part of uh, uh, an invitation for a show that I was researching. And we have Isama Noguchi circled at the center. And then we have everybody, him connected with everybody else that he knew. So what this tells us is either... 13 other people suggested to the, the, the curator that they include Isama Noguchi in their show, or Isama Noguchi was responsible for recommending 13 other artists he knew to be in his show. And so the know-how and the know-who and being supportive of your art community is very important. This may sound too hokey or formal, but make yourself a business card with your email, your phone, your Instagram, and your website, if you have one. Now, it may seem formal, but it's actually the fastest, 
easiest way to exchange contact information at crowded events. It does not have to be fancy. This one by Paul Hunt, very plain, but totally useful. The one that I did, I did in the uh, Microsoft Word. I just printed it out on the cardstock of my own home computer and cut them apart. And um, it's got me introduction after introduction, job after job for years. Other people get more involved, but you should not let the notion of like, oh, well, I have to get a fancy card or I can't afford to have them printed. You can just do a simple card, print it out on your home printer on cardstock, and you're all ready to go. The important thing is to have them with you at all times. Have an Instagram account that is only art related. Post images from shows you've seen, cultural events, interesting but professional only. Make sure to keep any account you have with personal stuff. Drunken parties, obsessions with shoes, separate and private. Innocent but personal posts and opinions can often end up embarrassing you later. And bear in mind, anybody who's going to have an interview with you will have already checked your social media. So please be aware of that. You have a professional life, you're, you have a personal life, but they should not necessarily intermingle. Another major realization is that the vast majority of your efforts may not result in any response, or maybe not an immediate response. That's why you must constantly be reaching out, seeing people and staying in contact. You may get many rejections, but remember it only takes one positive response to result in a job. Another realization is that money-wise, most entry-level jobs in the arts are poorly paid, or they may even begin as unpaid volunteer jobs. Now, this isn't ideal, this isn't fair, but this is how the world is at the moment. You should consider that there can be other important forms of compensation other than money. One is the chance to learn exclusive, expensive archiving and inventory computer programs <clears throat> that only museums and galleries can afford. And learning those programs then qualify you for future better jobs. Second is you learn the real day-to-day -day functioning of the art world and you can decide what aspect of it you really want to be involved with. And the third is that you will meet people who might later write uh, reference letters for you and that can be of great value. Now where to look for jobs? Well basically everywhere. There are publications, there are artist bulletin boards, museum and gallery websites, always have a job listing or careers section, and word of mouth, let people know like, oh, you know, I'm looking, I'm getting out of school, I'm looking around for a job, I don't know what I'm going to, to do. Do you have any suggestions? Join any professional organization that you can, read and study their websites for possibilities. And you can seek out art communities, small, medium, or large. Each can be good. I mean, you do have to be somewhere where people are doing art. And so you should think, if you go to a small city or town uh, or work in a small space, like a, a not-for-profit space, you may get to experience um, a lot of different jobs. You may be sort of like the jack of all trades, and that's very valuable. If you have an opportunity to work for a large institution or gallery, you may learn specialized skills and you may play small parts in larger projects. If you find some, something in the medium range, you have a mixture of opportunities. And in each case, it can be a good opportunity. Now, a couple of examples I'll show you are two curators who had been mentors to me uh, and what their lives trajectories were like. Ingrid Schaffner was born in Pittsburgh and after grad school at the Whitney program, she got a job which everybody else thought would be boring, sitting and cataloging and measuring all of the artwork by the sculptor Richard R. Schwager. But while uh, Schaffner was doing this, she met people who came through uh, Art Schwager's studio 
And in the evening, she wrote many essays and many small books, an entire series of uh, little books, sort of like info beginner style books about all different artists. And so she built up her record as being a published uh, author. And she was eventually hired as a curator at the Institute of Contemporary Art in Philadelphia, where she curated a wide range of shows there and as a guest curator, uh, a wide range of sort of like contemporary artists, historical artists, um, all different media from ceramics to surrealism. And, uh, you know, she was there sort of for 15 years. She was then, since she was born in Pittsburgh, there is a phenomenon that kind of goes like Pittsburgh likes Pittsburgh or Texas likes Texas or perhaps Bordeaux likes Bordeaux. And so she was sort of scouted out and invited to be the curator of the 57th Carnegie International at the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh, which hired her for five years to organize the show and produce these catalogs and stuff. And so that became her next big project. And at the end of that, she was exhausted from five years of traveling the world and putting together this giant museum-wide show. She moved to Lubbock, Texas uh, to be with her, her uh, architect uh, partner, and she continued to do writing. But just as Pittsburgh likes Pittsburgh, Texas likes Texas. And when people in the Texas art community learned that Ingrid Schaffner now lived in Texas, Lo and behold, the Chinati Foundation, which is a 300 acre sort of like spread uh, featuring the work of Donald Judd and uh, the other sort of minimalists, they created a new position for her as the first curator of the foundation. And so she is now sort of uh, in charge of the 350 acre foundation site with 33 buildings uh, and more exhibition space than probably the Whitney or any of the museums in New York, or all of them combined. So one thing leads to another. In the case of Bonnie Richlack, she had gotten an MFA in sculpture. And when she moved to New York, she was hired as a young studio assistant to Isamu Noguchi. She helped in the studio. She uh, was given increasing responsibilities, Noguchi saw, well, she can do whatever needs done again. So she did secretarial work, planning, shipping, management uh, of all aspects of Noguchi's career. And when Noguchi decided to found his own museum, he had Bonnie Richlack there from the outset, and he appointed her as the curator of the museum, a role in which she served for 30 years. She did many, many shows in Noguchi's work. She did multiple publications. And now she's a world authority on the work of this one artist. In the meantime, she continued to show her own sculpture and artwork and to curate shows independently. And here are three examples of her own artwork and a couple examples of publications that she's done since she has retired from the Noguchi Museum. Now, and finally, in my case, where did I come from? Where am I going? Well, I had an MFA in painting and graphics and I did early pre-digital work with color Xerox collages and I did painting. And I worked drafting and architectural model building for MoMA, Christo, Richard Serra and many other artists. Uh, I curated little shows in emerging, uh, you know, in uh, alternate spaces about emerging artists appropriated images and language at like PS122 in its first year and the Franklin Furnace uh, where I did found language which featured turntable mixes by Grandmaster Flash and the uh, found sound recordings by David Byrne and Brian Eno uh, as artwork for the first time. I also included, gave Gene Silverthorne and William Pope L uh, their first uh, gallery exposure in New York and exhibited David Wanarowitz's audio sort of like stories. Uh, I reconstructed lost models for the Noguchi Museum of Noguchi's public projects. 
which had been lost in shipping or whatever, but the museum wanted them. And then they gave me the notion of reconstructing a lost chess set that was a precursor to all of Noguchi's slotted planar sculptures in the mid 1940s. I was given this one photo to work from and sort of through some research and a lot of drawing, redrawing, testing and making samples, I arrived at this, this final uh, version of the set, a replica of it that they could use in exhibiting with the uh, chessboard that he had made. And my research revealed that he had made it because he was invited to this group show, The Imagery of Chess, along with all the surrealist expatriates and the, uh, the New York school sort of like young aspirant artist. And so I was invited on the basis of that research to be the first guest artist curator. And we did this show of a hundred, over a hundred works by 32 artists that uh, reassembled the lost works and all of the works in this show, which had been uh, described as an important event, but all of the documentation had been lost. And so my job was to be the detective and to put it all back together again. I tracked down and reassembled works and works that had photos, but were lost, uh, like this Zante Shawinsky sort of uh, chess set assemblage, a uh, wine chess set made by the critics Andre Breton and Nicholas Callas, uh, the Yves Tanguy chess set that there was only one photo of. And then interestingly, sort of like a chess table by Zenia Cage, who in 1944 was John Cage's wife. And this was as John Cage was beginning to have an affair with Merce Cunningham and Zenia was having an affair with Max Ernst. And so for this show, she made a table, not for John Cage, but for Max Ernst. And I tracked down the original table. It was too fragile to be moved. And so I measured it and this is the original and this is the replica that I made so that Zenia Cage would not be left out of the history of art. From that experience, subsequent catalogs and shows sort of like came my way of the young British artist, Man Ray, Sherry Levine, Len Kaino, uh, and Takako Saito, who interestingly, when I was researching the Surrealist chess show, I found that Takako had made over a hundred chess sets. And I thought, how interesting. So I started writing to her and we became pen pals and we were pen pals for about 12 years until she said, well, I'm having this big retrospective and I think you should write a catalog essay about my games and chess sets. So I ended up in Bordeaux at the opening where I met Deborah Bowman and explain, that explains why I'm talking to you today. Now, the knowledge I acquired researching and working with the exhibition designer on the new Gucci show led to a three-year job, master planning, the Brooklyn Navy Yard History Design Center. And that was because I had experience researching, I had experience with exhibition design. And when I was going to art school, I worked in a steel mill and a railroad car factory as a welder. And so these industrial buildings on this abandoned sort of 300 acre site, I could take people into and explain sort of what the overhead cranes were therefore, and where the foundry was, et cetera, et cetera. And so that real world knowledge acquired at a summer job got me a job sort of later in my life. <clears throat> then the master planning experience at the Navy Yard and the knowledge of chess led me to being hired to do master planning for a chess museum. And the research in the artist's designs and the refabricating sort of replicas led to sort of uh, uh, me working, producing low-priced estate authorized editions of chess sets and other designs by 20th century artists. This is Sophie Tauber Arp's uh, uh, marionettes for King Stag, uh, Man Ray chess set and the Noguchi chess set among others. And so one thing leads to another. And there's no bad experience. Everything adds to sort of your skill sets and your background. So I encourage you to examine the art world, to examine your skill sets and keep adding to them, to stay in touch with people and to meet new people, 
exercise your know-how and your know-who, and whatever you do, don't forget to write a thank you note. Thank you very much. And if you're interested, here are books about the art world. And art dealers and art historians and how they made their way in the world. And so again, I must thank uh, Professor Bauman and thank all of you for your time and your interest. Thank you so much, Larry. This is uh, just uh, fascinating to hear all these stories. Um, and for example, as a student, I never would have thought of becoming a curator or an art consultant or working for an artist estate. Um, and so I wanted to ask you um, a, a, a few questions. Uh, first of all, the first question is, when you talk about writing a thank you note, which seems to be really important, <laughs> Um, of course, I'm not sure you mean an email. Oh, no. <laughs> no, email is regarded as chaff. And, and so, you know, if you write an actual note that they get in the mail, they're holding something physical in their hands, and it makes it much more, it has much greater impact and is much more memorable than because uh, people who, who are, are curators or, or busy artists or museum people, especially, I, I've never met a museum person who, who wasn't late for a meeting, who didn't have too much to do, who didn't have to work on the weekends. And so you want to have something that is memorable and, you know, like they get hundreds of emails a day. And so if you email them, they may get your email, they may read it, but if you send them something in the mail, they will definitely get it. There, at least that's been my experience. I mean, times change very rapidly. So I may be uh, uh, behind, behind the times there, but, but anyway, that's my opinion. Um, actually, I think, it's a radical idea, and I think you're ahead of your time because compared to a few years ago, uh, hardly anyone sends real letters anymore with a stamp and handwritten. And I think that's a, a fabulous idea because um, I or anyone else who gets a lot of emails, I would absolutely open a letter that was addressed to me. That's for sure, because it's an unusual occurrence. So that's a great idea. The other question I wanted to ask you was, um, how does one go about finding these jobs? Because, for example, I, I can't imagine if you want to be a curator or, um, or an art consultant, that you're going to wait and look for an interesting um, and, and hope <laughs> to find an interesting employment ad listing, what they call in French, les petites annonces. So if I was a student, what, or a graduating student, yeah. what would I do if I wanted to work as a curator and art consultant? Uh, you, would, you would look for an entry level job you know, because probably it's unlikely that um, even if you find a listing for a curator, well, you just read the job descriptions. And if your skill sets match the job description, apply for it. But in many cases, it's like whether it's Ingrid Schaffner or uh, Bonnie Richlack or anybody, it's sort of they didn't start by being a curator. Okay. They didn't start by being a curator. Uh, they started by doing whatever work was necessary. And, you know, in the case of um, interns or research assistants that I have had, um, you know, I had them sort of, just as I said, do this work that has to get done that I don't want to do. But in doing that, 
they learned the skills, exactly the skills that were most desired by other people in other museums. And in one case, sort of, um, you know, I was able to place my, my research assistant uh, at the Whitney, and she's now an assistant curator at the Whitney, and an, another one at the Noguchi Museum, another one at the Getty, uh, the Met, uh, Stanford University, uh, and all like that. But they started all in positions of like, here, sort these 500 things, or, you know, like measure, measure each one of these drawings carefully and write it down and stuff. And the thing is, is like one needs to put in that time sort of getting intimately familiar from the smallest detail on up. I mean, I once, uh, when I was building models for kind of important architect, uh, an architecture student came and said, can I please work for you? Uh, I'll work for free. I just want to work with you on this project. I said, well, okay. And so he didn't have any experience building models. And so, uh, you know, like the first thing I said, well, okay, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to tidy up the studio, put away all the tools in the proper drawers. And uh, if you could, please sweep the floor from end to end of the studio. And so I was beginning to assemble this complicated model. And so he rushed around and in, in 20 minutes, he said, okay, it's all done. And I went and I looked and the tools weren't in the, the right tool drawers. There was still, you know, uh, broom marks and dust all over the floor. And I just said to him, how can I trust you to do an important job if you weren't willing or able to do even the simplest thing perfectly. And that's why I say there's no, every job in the art world, it's an important job. Every detail is an important detail. And you prove your value by executing each job, you know, as well as you can. That's a great story. I love it. Um, and also, and that brings me to another question. If I wanted to be a curator, um, could I like write, and I was a student, of course, and could I write to you or to another curator whose work I had seen and admired and say, um, I would like to be your intern or sure. whatever? Yes. How would that be received? It, it depends. I, I mean, if you're in the middle of a project and you have a lot to do. It's sort of like, it could be received like manna from heaven. Uh, <laughs> or the, the thing is, is sort of, it's, it's always a great thing. And, and that's the way, that's the way sort of a, a lot of people sort of uh, become involved. And, and, you know, like I said, it's like, you may sort of write to a lot of people or things like that and never hear a word, but, you just have to, if, you know, the big thing is like, who do you get involved with? You get involved with people who are interested in being involved. And once again, willing to do whatever needs done. And so that's, that's the basic thing. Okay. That sounds right. That sounds great. That sounds really the way to go. Uh, to, to gain that valuable first experience yes. um, as a curator, something else, because gosh, I may have finished my master's and I don't want to go to school anymore. I don't want to do a training, another, another degree in curating or whatever. Yes. Um, and, and, and so it would be more hands-on experience. Yeah. Well, at a certain point you have to, you have to, be involved with the real world because right. at a, a certain point sort of the academic community their value is to advance research of of a theoretical nature and so that path is a valuable one but it is a different it diverges at a certain point from what's going on out in the world day to day and so you know, if you want to engage in that, you, you kind of have to uh, get started. Yes, very good. Um, also, um, I would like to know, um, oh, 
another thing you 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 talked about place and and where you go what has been interesting for me uh, is that um, after um, uh, after being in Boston, uh, art director of East West Magazine, East West Journal, uh, and I came to France, I was American in France, which was really different. And this has helped me so much here because um, I'm more unusual. I have other experiences and so on. Exactly right. And I think it's a great idea, too, to think about um, the fact that you're going to have a variety of work experiences in your life, and that, as you said, each one is valuable. I have benefited so much from working for a magazine in a corporate environment and managing a, a team of people, and then um, going back to school, being an artist, doing other things. Um, advertising, and then also teaching, but later in life. And, and it's really that variety of experiences that I think, which, um, which is important as well, which you mentioned. And then another question I wanted to know, uh, it's kind of fascinating, this world of art consultants for businesses, um, for corporations, uh, for example, um, uh, here, um, here in France, there's several that are going to come back to me in a moment. <laughs> but, yeah. um, but, uh, and I know in the United States, the corporate art collections are very important as well that, with art consultants. How does one go about doing that? The same way, find an internship? Well, or, yes, I think that I'm, unless, unless you were born into a family of significant means who collect art or are friends with people who collect art so that you have some kind of circle of contacts to begin with, um, one would, you should work for somebody who actually knows what they're doing. You know, because you can learn things all by yourself, but it's painful, uh, it's expensive, and it's often very unproductive. And so even, even working for free for someone who really knows something, basically, it's like, it's like going to school without paying tuition. But, uh, yeah, but it, it's just that I think that these days, the social media make such a celebrity uh, world of the art world and everybody wants to sort of like, you know, be sort of in the, in the, you know, the selfie pictures with somebody famous and stuff immediately. And most of the people I know who have any lasting value have worked many years diligently doing once again whatever needed done and really learned you know like any of these things is a craft and sort of uh you know sort of having a gallery sort of or something like that it's a relationship business and and you have to sort of like that's why i say you you know meet people stay in touch with people and all like that, but don't expect, like I said at the interview, it's not about wonderful you. It's absolutely not. It's like when you're in school, the focus is on you because you know you're you're the you're the the client, you're the customer in a way. But once you're out in the world, you're not the customer. You are well, Jasper Johns once said. Artists are the elite of the servant class. And so you have to sort of embrace that. That's, that's good advice. Um, just, just to end, um, I, you talked about relationships with people. And also, um, even in your last talk, um, the importance of generosity. Would yes. you say that um, uh, acts of generosity and kindness and, uh, and doing things for people um, is an important 
really comes back to you? What what are those qualities? Oh yes, yeah. No, that, it, it's it's very important. It's sort of uh, the other thing is uh, yeah, the art world. It isn't about you. It's about the art, and it's about you know your client or your employer. It's um, it's people become interested in people who are interested in them. And so the notion of being interested in other people, not being the person at the opening who says, hi, you know, my name is Larry and, and here's the nine interesting things that I've been working on. It's like, hi, my name's Larry, who are you? What, what brings you here to this opening? Oh, what do you do? That's, that's the direction that you go. And, you know, and when you're talking about yourself, you're not learning anything. And so it's only when you're talking with and about other people and other ideas is that you, you learn things and that you develop any further. So yeah, and anytime you can do a person a favor, by all means you should do it because you never know when, when you may need a favor sort of somewhere out in the, the karmic future. <laughs> uh, and so that's, that's the thing. That's great. I, I think that's um, an excellent and excellent advice to young artists. And also it goes against this uh, cliche, which is unfortunately sometimes true of graduating art students uh, who were very full of themselves and very confident and so on and think they're going to conquer the world. Well, um, those that, those humanistic qualities are, are really important as well. Yes. Um, and, and I'm sure that artists, uh, artists who stay as studio artists, the ones who are generous and, um, uh, and, uh, and also modest um, uh, go much further in the long run than those who are otherwise. <laughs> yes yeah well again thank you so much for inviting me to uh to uh speak with uh you and 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 your students thank you so much larry list it's been a very interesting experience